All right. So um, basic rules about mixing. So the topic is basically mixing. So basic rules to follow. Some of them apply to linear media and some of them, actually all of them could apply to both linear and nonlinear, but you'll see that some of them are way easier to control. In linear media, mixing a trailer or mixing a movie or a TV show, you've got full control. In nonlinear, you have to make decisions. HDR is a good tool to actually help you making decisions, ducking tools and all kind of uh, tricks that you can do to actually uh, focus on the right elements. But there are also uh, decisions you can do on the design part of things. So you can actually kill sounds voluntarily by design saying, well, I'm in a cutscene. Why not get rid of all random effects and get rid of the useless stuff uh, so we can focus on the real thing? So basic rules, the dialogue. Dialogue is king. Uh, not all dialogue is of equal pertinence. You know, you have dialogue that actually is uh, sometimes NPC running around being shot at and saying, oh my god, or oh shit, or oh. Uh, so this is not of equal importance than your actually storytelling main dialogue. But dialogue should always cut through when it is uh, meaningful to the player or meaningful to the story. The visual, if you're working on a linear piece of art, you're actually serving a visual that you have. So um, often I find my, myself uh, featuring the most important thing, taking the approach that what you see is what you get. And if I see someone speaking, going like this, I don't need to hear the footsteps because the focus is that that person is talking to me and I see the face or torso and I don't need to hear useless things. So make decisions uh, as based on what you are actually seeing. The story, if you're working on, let's, let's use a, a, say a three and a half minute uh, trailer. Uh, it, it is generally carrying some kind of story to it. You have to get a clear idea of what you're about to say, what you want to uh, highlight in that story and find the climax or climaxes and say, I'm going to spend more time on these things because they're going to be more interesting. The emotion. So story is what you're trying to tell. The emotion is what you want to convey. You want actually the uh, strong points, the climax parts that, uh, to shake people, to actually mean something. So to get all of this working, you have to make decisions. You have to decide what you're going to prioritize in terms of time and in terms of playing things and not playing other things. I like to say less is best. And I like to say that a subtraction can actually be an addition. If you remove the useless stuff, you can actually um, uh, get way more, uh, uh, a way more efficient message. All of these slides actually are on the slide sharing uh, thing on the game connection site. So if this is a, there are a couple of things that didn't translate properly on the site, but the info is there. Things to avoid. Way easier to avoid some of these things when you're mixing uh, uh, linearly, but some of these can actually be also done in nonlinear media. Distracting, distracting perspectives. If you've got a face-to-face -face conversation and you actually have camera going to show you face-to-face -face who's speaking and they're face-to-face -face, and let's say there's a fireplace uh, on the side or an open window or a ticking clock and the camera is playing the perspective, well, if you do it realistically, the fireplace is going to shift from left to right in your speakers as you actually uh, go from uh, one person to the other. That's annoying. To me, this is really annoying, although it's really realistic. You probably want to go some other way about it. So keeping the focus on the main important things, I'll show you a couple of tricks of how to actually uh, get away with this, having it better, uh, serving the, the purpose of the main conversation better. Distracting elements. The difference between the two is that elements are just things that happen elsewhere. And you have, say, your couple speaking there, and you have a, a junkyard truck outside going beep, beep, beep. You don't need this. It is not serving the purpose. And whether it's game or linear media, uh, you don't need useless stuff that actually takes away from the, uh, what you're trying to ex 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 express. 
The exit, exit sign effect is actually the same thing, but it really is used as a 5-1 type of thing. If you're focusing, and if it's a dialogue-driven, again, dialogue-driven scene, and you're focusing on the dialogue, you don't want loud things to happen in the surround channels unless it is useful. In games, this, is, this might be very different because if an enemy is showing up at the back, you want to hear it. And it is actually a volunteer, voluntarily use of exit sign effect type of thing where you're not focusing on dialogue, you want to give a cue to the player. But if the cue is, if the cue is not necessary, if it's a dialogue-driven scene, you don't want uh, annoying noise uh, that means nothing coming out of the rear channel. Abusive panning. When I first started working uh, at Ubisoft and I first started playing games, I said, wow, I, I couldn't get over how ugly panning was. Like how unsmooth it was. Uh, and at some point I got over it. But abusive panning, what I mean by abusive panning, it, at, it can actually be realistic, but it can get annoying. Going back to the idea of a, of a narrative, uh, dialogue-driven scene, if you have a slight movement and the dialogue is constantly moving, especially front to rear, which is even more annoying, um, it can be actually realistic. If you're moving, it, you may w logically would want to move the dialogue back and forth, but if it takes away the interest of listening and the focus of what the person is saying, kill the, the panning, I say. Establishing or not playing until. Two things that are easy to do in linear mixing. Your fireplace, if it's playing and you've got the two guys, guy or girl, talking, you can actually play it at the beginning and then slightly EQ it, get rid of it, bring it smoothly to the center, let it play. And then your camera perspective will not be as annoying because you're actually monoizing the thing, you're making it part of the ambience now. Same thing with the not playing until. If something is not required in a two minute scene, you can actually bring it smoothly at some point and say, oh, there it is, never noticed that it came in. So this is easy to do in linear media. There are rules that you can apply in games to actually have these things working. In a non-linear wor world, the place where I work, Ubisoft Montreal, is we concentrate on AAA titles. So that means we have more time, generally, and generally more budget to do things. So we care about people that have a good listening environment, and we try to do things so that they sound right in a home theater system. Home theater system are used by multiple people in various uh, types of setup for various uses, usage. So type of game, audience is, um, is a point, but the main point, and that's what most of the rest of my uh, presentation is about, is about perception of loudness, level consistency, being able to have a setup where you can actually go from a TV show, play a game, watch a movie, listen to music, and have things relatively ballpark in the same kind of level without having to jump on the remote and be able to listen to a com comfortable level. The reason why there are rules, the Calm Act in the US for commercials and uh, broadcast rules is because there were complaints. If no one complained, uh, there would be no rules. But we don't want video games to be in a strict rule. So the only way we can actually do games and not have a law forcing us to respect levels is by doing it right and telling other people how to do it right. So education is kind of the key in there so that we actually uh, do things properly and everybody does. So about perception of loudness. Perception of loudness differ is different between each people. It's age-related, it's mood, fatigue, uh, taste, people like loud stuff. It's different between each in, uh, individual and it can actually be different between you and yourself. If you're tired, you don't want loud stuff. So it is very hard to measure, it is very hard to have tools that actually do it absolutely perfectly, but there were very great attempts at doing it and that's what I'm gonna talk about and they actually are successful, very successful. 
My point is not to talk about La Nussoir. There's enough people that talked about it, but the problem between like having level consistency, the problem exact was actually born uh, from the fact that uh, broadcasters were actually using peaks to level their things. And peaks convey absolutely no information about how loud a program is. It tells you that it has louder transients, and it actually has nothing to do with how loud we perceive uh, the program to be. So peak normalization, peak metering, and uh, the digital world, when digital media appeared, uh, we no longer had a zero VU reference point, a target to aim for. We were actually looking at a ceiling saying, I'm going to get there. So that's how Landis War actually started. Okay, I have a zero dB full scale. That's how loud I can get. And guess what? Limiters became so great that we could actually get there. And get there and get above it and just smashing the shit out of the signal. So we actually um, hit that zero dB full scale and go way over it. So ceiling instead of target, we lost that. We lost a, um, a common point of reference. Instead, we went for the, the sky. We lost our zero VU. OK, getting into the bulk of levels. The zero VU, the VU meter itself, was not a bad invention. It was an electrical measurement with ballistic that was similar to the human ear. And what you'd see on a, on a VU would ballpark represent how loud things would be. RMS is actually, um, an, uh, rather than electrical, it's, it's a mathematical um, calculation. It is actually uh, the square root of the average of the squares. So it is a measurement that represents loudness better than the VU scale, yet not absolutely perfect, because it is uh, an un, uh, unfiltered, unweighted uh, uh, measurement. But it does uh, uh, represent fairly well uh, the loudness of, thing, of things. We still use Doro meters for level, for dialogue leveling, even though there are plenty of other tools. It's a choice. The main reason why we still use Doro, and I'm not, you know, I'm not here to advertise Doro versus Logitech or any other. Uh, the reason why we use these is just because they're instantaneous. There's no latency. There's no heavy calculation happening. So you actually have instant feedback. And what I refer to by the persistence range, and this is not something I invented, this is actually the actual LEDs on the meters that are uh, solidly lit, and that's telling you uh, the RMS value, where the bouncing things above it are the actual peak values. The new norm, initially introduced as LKFS, now called BOAT, L-U-F-S, L-K-F-S, applies K-weighting filtering in the measurement path. So we're not listening through a filter, but the signal being analyzed is actually going through a filter. It's going to get technical from that point on. <clears throat> it's based on the International Telecommunication, Telecommunication Union um, algorithm, the 1770 algorithm. We'll make, keep this simple. I, I will not say the whole name every time. And that was originally developed by the ITU, released in 2006. But prior to that, there were very uh, important researches done uh, by Gilbert Soulodre. Uh, in Ottawa, the Communications Research Center. Um, they used tons of people. They gave them basically a button to tweak levels. They had a reference signal, and it was done over with tons of audio examples, listening to audio examples, turning it up or down, comparing A, B with a reference uh, source, and saying, I think this sound equally as loud, poof. Go, next, next shot. So they, didn't, they did tons of studies like this, and uh, that gave birth to the K-weighting filter that I'm about to, to talk about, which gives a very, very close correlation between uh, what's measured actually on the meters and what is perceived as being equally as loud by real human beings. K-weighting filter. 
Uh, if you read the 1770 document, you'll see that they refer to it as the RLB or R2LB filter. They're the same thing. The RLB and what th that stands for is, um, is a revised B uh, low frequency curve. So it's a revisited version of the low pass, um, the low cut filter that is being used in B uh, weighting. You probably remember A, B, C, there's even a D weighting. It's basically applying a roll off of the low frequency in the measurement path so that it actually uh, is more representative of what we perceive. The B weighting is actually a bit heavier cut. So K weighting is a revised version of the B uh, low cut filtering. And the R2LB is the further revision that actually added this little bump here, starting ballpark around 1K. It's about a 4 dB boost. And that's, the, that's what they refer to as pre-filtering. And then you go into this uh, low cut filter before you actually uh, measure stuff. And measurement in R2L, well, in uh, 1770 and uh, EBU uh, standard, standard R128 that I'm about to talk about. This is always done on the summation of all channels. Stereo 51, you actually add them up all together and then you measure the result. Fletcher and Munson curve, one of the first thing in the 101 audio courses that you see, but what this is representing is equal loudness contour. So it is actually the amount of energy you need for a sound to be perceived as equally as loud based on its frequency. So if you see here, there's a little dip. This actually means that our ears are more sensitive between 1K to 5, 4, 5K. We're more sensitive in that range. So if I go back here, uh, that kind of explains that little bump at 1K up to 5-ish. And then the rest, they left it flat uh, reason being that you want filters to be cheap to design, very easy to design, and uh, high frequencies have actually very little energy. If you measure high frequencies, it doesn't trigger a meter. So you don't need to roll off and do the precise inverse curve that you have here. High frequencies, zero energy, low frequency trig will, will trigger meters like crazy. That means, that's why, and they have established that the kind of slope we have here makes perfect sense to get a clear, uh, a good representation of loudness. So rolling off some of the low end, but not too much of it. All right, a brief history on, two, on three slides actually of how this thing developed into what it is now and how it has become a standard for broadcast and now becoming an accepted recommendation and even a TRC for Sony PS4 and PS3. Uh, it has uh, evolved into something that, uh, that at some point we won't have to talk about this topic anymore. But we still, we still do for now because there are people that don't, uh, still don't get it. 2006, initial uh, first document. Uh, LKFS units uh, used to give a measurement of loudness averaged out over the full duration of the program. So it, essentially for broadcasters, uh, just saying, okay, I need to play a, a show, it has to be at that level, I have a given measurement, I can say, yes, it's compliant, I'm going to play it. So they designed the algorithm based on the research did in uh, the uh, uh, Canadian um, uh, re Research uh, Communication uh, Centre in Ottawa. So they designed an algorithm that gave birth to the filter I just showed you, the K-weighting filter. The EBU, European Broadcasting Union, we have the ATSC in North America. They are basically managing uh, broadcast. In 2010, they defined, the first, they, they actually ran away with the basic 1770 uh, statement and they defined additional parameters that they considered should be measured and should be taken into consideration because there were and any standards like this are always going to uh, evolve. So nothing is perfect and people eventually, and there has been a second and a third rev revision to the 1770 and there will possibly be more. So define the need for three uh, types of measurement, program loudness, 
as defined in the 1770. But two more parameters, the maximum true peak level as opposed to sample peak, I'll get to this in a few minutes. And something called the loudness range, basically the loudness dynamic. So the difference between the perceived loudness, the lower and the upper uh, range of the perceived loudness. Furthermore, under the program loudness, they define three parameters that are in there. So we should be able to, rather than measuring the whole thing, we should be able to have a sliding window of 0.4 seconds, so nearly instantaneous kind of measurement, which they refer to as momentary. Short term, it actually is fluctuating a bit slower, easier to read, a three second read. And in both of these cases, they are not gated. Gate coming up in a few seconds. So they are measuring all the time without a gate. Where the integrated full-time loudness is a gated measurement, getting to the gate thing. So the introduction of the EBU uh, R128 gave birth to a couple of, uh, of new, um, that's actually just a few months after the initial R128, uh, R128 document. The 3341 document uh, defines the three terms that were born from these three, from these various types of measurements. LUFS rather than LKFS, we add the 1770 called it LKFS, loudness K-weighted relative to full scale. Here they use LUFS instead of LKFS. Gave birth to the loudness unit, which is roughly a dB, getting to this in a few seconds. And the LRA, loudness range, three new terms, and they introduced the idea of gating in the measurement chain. They inserted in there a uh, minus 70 LUFS gate. The reason for this is that you don't want to measure signal that is 70 dB below your full scale because it is irrelevant. No one's going to say this is very loud. So you just want to get rid of useless thing that would, that would actually just make your measurement less robust because you could, could actually have a, a broadcast of a golf game and all of a sudden you have a ball being hit and say, oh wow, that's dynamic. Okay. <laughs> so you actually, you actually uh, by getting rid of uh, very low amplitude, and in that case we're talking about uh, system noise basically, minus 70. So you don't want this to interfere with your measurement. They added, at that point, a relative uh, uh, threshold, a second gate with a relative threshold relative to the measured momentary loudness. So you always measure your momentary loudness in a non-gated way. And there's a second actual gate that follows up 8 dB. Used to be 8, now it's 10. 8 dB below. And this is go what goes into your analysis of loudness. The gate is inserted post-summation, so it's not a gate on every individual channel. You do a summation, you apply this gate, and only what goes above this gate, the word says it, gate means you can't pass, what goes above that threshold actually goes into the measurement scale. At that point, we were referring to LKFS, the typical 1770 as an ungated measurement and the LUFS as a gated measurement. Right away, right after, three months after actually, in, um, in March, the, the ITU and the EBU agreed on minus 10 as being the new standard and it's been the same ever since. Quick point about LU versus DB, they are the same but you can, that's a definition I came up with. It's basically an LU is that dB measured through K-weighting key key filtering. So for a, a dialogue thing, dialogue is actually slightly different because if you remember the K-weighting gets rid of low frequency and actually has a bump starting at 1K. So if you have a deep voice with lots of low end, it will actually measure slightly different whether you go through K-weighting or not. For a male voice, it's about the RMS versus uh, loudness unit measurement is about two LU difference. 
For female voice, slightly less, 1, 1 1.5. Depends on the range. If it's a really piercing voice, we get into that little 4 dB bump type of thing. You see, you see what I mean? So it is very close, but slightly different. For full scale, really big low end program, RMS and LU will be further away. Well, LU, let's, let's call it uh, 1770 or EBU measurement, EBU mode measurement will be slightly further away because the low frequency will actually trigger RMS meter uh, where they'll be kind of ignored. Well, what's below say 6080 will be ignored in the uh, LK, LA, LUFS measurement. So gate minus 10 from that point, LKFS equal LUFS is just two words saying the same thing since March 2011. At some point, one of the two will say, okay, we'll let go. So ITU uh, BS 1770-3 uh, just introduced a new way to calculate uh, peaks, uh, true peaks. Let's talk about true peaks. Um, this is a very bas basic uh, analog 8K signal with potential points where samples could be captured in that signal. You've seen this as the most elementary kind of uh, continuous analog versus discontinuous sample based uh, digital signal. But this is a good, fair, clean representation showing that we do have signal of amplitude that is actually above the, the sample, uh, sample precision. So the typical brick wall limiters that we're using, like DL3 from Waves, is actually a sample-based brick wall limiter. So if you do have very high frequency transient that are very loud, chances are that some of them will fall in between sample peak precision and will be above what you've set as your ceiling. So there are true, really true peak uh, limiters, but if you have a sample peak limiter, you should set your threshold, not your threshold, your ceiling slightly below. We set it to minus one for all dialogue work we do. So we give ourselves one dB of loose end for event, you know, typical peaks that will go in between. If you don't do this, uh, it will sound like modern music mastering, basically, where all the high frequencies are basically white noise. Uh, if, you, if you set your ceiling to zero, it means that everything that is above zero, which is all high frequency transient, gets clipped. Um, so giving yourself a couple of dB, and if you're going through, you know, this is, one dB is good for PCM, but if you're going through uh, codex, some codex will actually do nastier stuff and will actually require a bit more headroom. So you may want to control your, uh, your uh, bring your ceiling down if you know you're going through a crappy codec that will actually need a bit more headroom to do its job. The way they achieve uh, true peak uh, limiting is by interpolation using oversampling. So filling out the gap between samples, you actually can derive the actual waveform that should be there that was intended or was originally there in analog and you can do a better job at controlling uh, peaks. The loudness range. How are we doing with time? Good. Good? All right. Because this is a tougher one, but uh, variations of loudness in program or loudness dynamic. It was the, the algorithm was developed by TC Electronics. It is basically the range of your persistent, persistence range on your Doro. So what you see as your RMS value, what you see as your momentary loudness when applying the K-filtering. So this range, it goes down to a given level over a period. This, this measurement is only good if you have a fairly long program. For short program, you can cheat, you can really uh, fool this algorithm easily. But for a longer period of program, you've got bits and pieces that are in lower persistence range, lower uh, mo momentary loudness, and the upper uh, range of it is, the difference between the two is your loudness range, expressed in loudness units in LU. So it is a statistical thing. It is actually going through statistical measurement techniques, typical like a survey type of thing, 
where they eliminate the extremes so that the measurement is more robust and more representative of, um, of the, the, the reality. The lower 10%, upper 5% are getting rid of, uh, they're get, getting discarded. There are two gates inserted in the measurement path, the same one we add in our uh, typical Lamus measurement is there, the uh, minus 70 Lamus unit relative to full scale, so that nothing below that gets measured. And additionally, there's a second gate that is actually used only for the LRA measurement, and it is below the integrated Lamus of the full program. So what was defined by the, the 1770, the integrated Lamus, then agreed to by the EBU as being the gated measurement of your full program. This is a known value. So if you have a movie and you know that the overall is, the value is minus 23, the LRA measurement applies a minus 43 gate, 20 dB below it, so that only what's above minus 43 goes into the LRA measurement. Everything else is discarded. This is done so that, let's say, the golf ball uh, example or a gunshot in a quiet movie, so that this is not judged as being uh, all of a sudden a super dynamic movie because it has one gunshot. Uh, so it is actually considering, you know, in your golf tournament uh, broadcast, considering the guys explaining, okay, oh, that was a nice shot. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the voice is taken into consideration, but not the wind and the birds. So uh, for Lambda's measurement. More on this, you can read the EBU Tech 3342 document. It is thoroughly ex explained, but I'm more than uh, happy to discuss this uh, after the presentation or in the question period, as I read these things several times. Um, this is the matrix, this is a DVD version. This is uh, coming from that document. Actually, from the document, they've got a couple of extra. I should have used that as a slide rather than this uh, source. But the, it's actually minus 21.3, I think, the integrated loudness. And the gate is at minus 41 point something. So the gate is actually about here. And that's the 20 dB, 20 LU range that is considered in the measurement. So the integrated loudness being at minus 21 sum doesn't mean that things don't get louder. They, get, they do get louder and the range is taken from discarding the 10% that is below the minus 41.3 and discarding the 5% that is at the top here, getting rid of these two things. Uh, gives you the actual uh, range of 25 LU, which is quite dynamic. The movie theater uh, version of it, I think, is like 40. So it's a super dynamic mix. Um, and it's before, you know, at that time, theaters were still calibrated at 85, and movies were really allowed to be dynamic. As they got louder and louder, Theaters started turning down the playback volume. People started mixing louder, less dynamic. Lamus War uh, movie version. <coughs> so how to read this is actually the actual loudness is on the X scale, and this is how often does it get that loud type of thing, and the energy is what what's underneath the the curve. Broadcast standards were born from that. Bit of text, but it's very simple. North American standard minus 24 LUFS plus or 2 dB of tolerance with peaks limited, true peak limited, true peaks limited to minus 2 dB true peak. The European version of it is minus 23 with a tolerance of plus minus 1 and peaks, uh, true peaks limited to minus 1. So slightly different yet. There's an overlap. Tolerance parameter allow for an overlap, so you could actually mix a show that will play and be accepted in broadcast in North America and in, the, in the Europe. Video, game, uh, video games level recommendations. They are now, Sony uh, uh, TRC now 
wrote, they wrote it. It's in, the, it's in the text. I haven't found any sign of it from Microsoft reading the uh, TCR, so it's not written yet. But if you mix for the one that tells you, you know, gives you rules to follow, you'll be fine for the second one. I can't imagine, well, Microsoft agrees with what Sony on di di uh, wrote on this, uh, and I can't imagine them coming with a different rule, saying, no, you want to mix for our game, it should be 2DB lower. No. So, uh, they huh? Do you have a white paper on it? Okay. Okay, and did they say minus 23 or 24? 23? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so they, they all agreed. Because I actually ra read in the, the, the TRC of uh, the last one from uh, Sony, uh, it actually said minus 24, but I think, it's a, I think it's a mistake. So I think it's really minus 23. But all of this being said, you know, we're, we're trying, we're not fighting over a DB, we're fighting over 10. Okay, so the reason why there are rules like this is for people to be ballpark within a reasonable range, not for people being one dB off. So, and I found on the web Nintendo that actually have uh, also an average loudness level recommended of being minus 24 uh, and lower for the Wii U. And they have set some kind of uh, arbitrary, arbitrary reference level so the, there is a thought behind, you know, behind this as uh, let's follow uh, what uh, Sony is doing and everything. Oh no, I didn't remember I did those as separate things, okay. But this is useful documents that you can download from the web and, and read and, uh, and learn more about it and spread the news. So this is it for me. Simon. Yes. I read the um, the last the uh, November thing. I don't know if it is. Good point. The, the, there's an important thing to say bef between recommendation and failing a, a, a submission uh, because you don't have it right. I think it is still a, rec a recommendation. Yeah. At UBC. Yeah, we're doing it internally at Ubisoft as well. The uh, testing department are equipped with uh, measurement tools. One thing that I didn't say but is very important is that you should measure a minimum of 30 minutes of content, representative content. So not, you know, yeah. Yeah, so if your game is about smelling the flowers half of the time and then uh, shooting the other half of the time, well, take half and half and do an average of this. So it should be a minimum of 30 minutes of representative content. What I suggest, and that's what we've been doing on the last few titles we mixed, is we run two uh, meters. One that we leave on forever and one that we reset once in a while. So you actually have your whole day of work on one meter, you know your LRA, you know your LUFS value, your target, and you're running one, say, so okay, now we're starting that map, uh, there's gonna be more action, you can reset it. As you reset the, uh, uh, the meter, you're actually resetting LRA as well, and you're resetting your LUFS overall measurement. So running two like this, you see, you know, and because there's a minus 70 gate, uh, it stops measuring when you stop playing. So it's not telling you, well, you stop playing today, you got a very low level at the end of the day. It, has, it is actually only measuring when the game is running. So uh, running two in parallel is a good idea. And 30 minutes of uh, representative content is the minimum Sony asks for. So we don't want to these to, for these to become real TRC or TCR. If people do it right, it's going to be, you know, we don't need a calm act in video games. If people don't do it right, well, eventually there will be strict rules about it. But in Montreal, we're, we've, we've been doing, you know, the last uh, few games, the last past couple of years, uh, is uh, we, they, they, they match, they really match. They're within tolerance and we measure, uh, measure them all day long. 
and we're about to set up actually something uh, on a, a network-based solution of measuring, well, not about, we want to eventually have a network-based measurement where it runs and you actually just go and see, ah, okay, this game that has been played a thousand times by these that many people actually measures that value. Is it right or not? Tweak it. Yep. Is there any um, value for the radio, some space radio station for that? Because not yet. Because you switch station, you want to stop and allow the louder. Yeah. It, there's no rules yet applied for this because it's harder to regulate because it's, it's, it's a mixture of analog and digital uh, information. When it's all in the digital world, you ca can actually have measurement tools. Uh, when broadcast is a mixture of digital and analog, it's harder to, to measure. iTunes has a, a, an interesting solution, Soundcheck, which is actually uh, uh, doing like you can add in metadata the actual measurement of the loudness of a tune, and actually it drops it. It has minus 16.5 as its uh, LUFS value, and will drop any super heavy compressed Metallica album, drop it down 13 dB, so it actually plays at the same level as the Neil Diamond. Uh, <laughs> so you see what I mean? So it actually is going for a center of gravity uh, measurement in LUFS and actually making things sound equally as loud. And then you can really tell the difference. Uh, you can really see the damage that abusive limiting and compression can do. Because compression is part of making rock music. No compressor, no rock music. It's, it's always going to be there. But it's used as a creative, it should be used as a creative tool. It should be used to make things sound good, not to make it sound louder. Yes. We're doing the English language file by file. We're still doing it like this. But we we do have batch processing for localization. But we're using the LUFS measurements of the English language to apply it to localization uh, in batch process. Yes, this, this option, yes. Okay, so if you've got a whispering line in English, then yeah. your other language... We're matching level, file by file, file, by file being done by a batch processing uh, okay. batch farm. Okay. So that, that way, you know, you mix for the English version, you make it sound right, even though tonally it may be slightly different in other la languages, you know that the value is going to be the same, the level is going to be the same, so your mix is going to be, uh, you know, probably actually closer than what if you were doing all languages by hand and allowing for human errors here and there. But doing things by hand sound better because you make decisions on DSing on the amount of compression you're doing the, uh, and so on and EQing and proximity effect. But our batch processing is tackling all of these things. Tons of plugins tweaked for all kind of scenarios, and it's uh, it's handling things quite quite nicely. I have uh, another question, but it fits over with the loudness because it will go back to the beginning of the presentation. Uh, for example, when when you were talking about the fanning stuff for yep. dialogue, for example, t let's take the, the case where. The, two NPC chatting together. So this is a, pre a 3D positioning stuff. So you may go around and fan the voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then suddenly uh, the game designer comes to you and say, oh, these voice are really important. I want the player to listen to them even if it's yeah. the other way. Like That's the, it's a design <laughs> decision at some point. They don't uh, need to be 3D positioned all the time. They could become 2D and be stationary for you know, a given type so of information. So you, you say that not, the, 
the best case would be to, to fully uh, ap apply fully to the dialogue and then maybe have a reverb into this so to be able to hear them. That would be one way of doing it or applying a roll-off curve that would be roll-off as volume curve. We, we use roll-off uh, for volume in games, but roll-off for me is a filtering thing. But like having a roll-off that would be different for these characters is an, another way to go about it. More? I think we're good. Hi, yes, go, Simon. Yes, yeah. yeah. We, we, we recommend at Ubisoft uh, 15. The EBU for living room condition is saying 20. 20 is quite dynamic, but if you've got a quiet living room, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, I, I like dynamics. I, I mix very dynamically and I like dynamics. But we made it a recommendation in, like internally at Ubisoft uh, for seven, uh, 15 as a value. But I think 20 is good. You know, if it's a, if it's a war game and an action-packed thing, I think it's good. Above this, it just gets... Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Some, some of the lower stuff will not be heard in a normal listening environment and your neighbors won't be happy when the loud stuff comes in. So, so it is... You know, we're not using dial norm. You know, we're not uh, using the dialogue as an anchor element. Uh, we're using the general LUFS, and that's what all those recommendations are about. They're not taking dial norm, Dolby uh, type of standard into consideration. It's the overall level. Uh, but that's an interesting topic by itself. You know, the, the whole idea of uh, dialogue level versus LUFS level in br typical broadcast program and in games. They're very close together. But in movies, especially older movies, more dynamic, your dialogue may be way lower than your overall uh, measurement of the, the full movie, especially if it's an act action-packed movie where there's like 200 lines of dialogue in the whole movie, the rest is action scene. Your LUFS is gonna be way higher than your dialogue level. So the p -Loud group, EBU p -Loud group, is working on standardization for movies like this of ways for movies when they're broadcast, and even in theaters that could be applied, for these two values, the dialogue level and the overall LUFS, LUFS value integrated, to be brought closer. And there are no magical ways of doing it. Either you apply dynamic control on your mix to actually reduce the range, or you find an halfway point in between with tolerance they're promoting the second kind of option for this. Yes? Uh, so Ubisoft, how does it, um, what do they appear well when they calibrate uh, the other listening environments? Because they're also struggling for it. Yeah, we're at, we're at 79 in, in, in our rooms, but we recommend mixing at 75. And the LFE input is, is boosted uh, 10 dB up, but just the LFE. The base management is, we're calibrated so that uh, the spectrum is as flat as possible when you're summing an individual channel with the uh, subwoofer being switched on. We, have, we still have Studio A, which is uh, calibrated at 82. But our other environments are at 79. And we recommend 75 as a monitoring level for mixing games. We don't want people to turn it lower than this because they'll mix higher. We, we, we think uh, that 75 is a good comfortable level to play a game eight, 10 hours in a row and still be able to make decisions that make sense uh, level wise. If you're playing at 79, you'll get fatigue. And if you play lower than this, you'll probably crank up your uh, ambiences way too, too loud. I'm sick of drumming and ambiences. Other questions? Great, thanks.